Welcome everyone. Welcome to the Wells Reserve at Bonho on this uh, blustery nor'easter of an evening. My name is Paul Destin, I'm the director here at the Wells Reserve. And we're delighted to offer the fourth and final in our series, From Moody to Goose Rocks, Public Access and Private Ownership from Nature Shirley. We've had some really great attendance at all of our uh, events, including a full house at the Moot Court room uh, with a panel discussion of many of the people who have been involved in this legal issue over the years, over the 25 years. So it has been 25 years since the Moody Beach, since the Supreme Court handed down a decision in Moody. A lot has happened since then. There have been other cases, including the Goose Rocks case just last spring. So we at the Reserve thought it would be a good opportunity, a great opportunity, to revisit the issue, to review the issue, to talk about the issues, to invite people in who have been involved in it, very much on a personal level, professional level, um, and um, it's, been, it's been a really good experience. I hope uh, all of you, those of you who have attended before, and those of you who are here this evening, I hope you've uh, learned something from it, and perhaps learned a different perspective. Because that's what we really wanted to do. We wanted to provide different perspectives on this particular issue. I would like to just introduce uh, the partners in this project. The Wells Reserve is not doing it alone. Uh, one of our partners is Lotto Trust, represented this evening by Scott Richardson. Lotto Trust is our private nonprofit partner. Uh, Maine C. Grant is Kristen Grant here. Kristen back there, Maine C. Grant, very much a partner with us as well, and also the Maine Coastal Program. And our other partner here, and I'll introduce him in a minute, is John Duff, uh, Professor of Policy and Law at the University of Massachusetts at, at Boston. So just a couple of things before we get going. I do need to mention a couple of uh, facts here. I think they'd be self-evident, but for your safety, I need to mention them. We're in the middle of Nor'easter. It's in Cowboys with lots of rain. We're in a barn that's 120 years old. And even though this barn is beautifully renovated, to support our 21st century mission, it still leaks. <laughs> so I do point, that's why we have such a wide alleyway here, right at the back where that chair is. It seems to be where our water is coming into our raised monitor. It, the rain has kind of subsided a little bit, so hopefully all is well. You don't need umbrellas. I would like to mention uh, that uh, we do, we are interested in your uh, opinion, perspective. We want, we, bottom line, we want you to evaluate uh, this evening's lecture. Uh, we've done it with all the previous ones. It's how we improve, uh, how we know what we're doing right, how we know what we're doing wrong, and how we can make course corrections. So this was on the seat when you came in, so if you could please fill this out. If you need a pen or a pencil, please, please let me know. And the final thing is, I did want to say that as part of this process, in addition to the great lecture and presentations we've had, uh, three of which have been recorded, and this one is being recorded on video, and will be on YouTube sometime next week, Scott? Is that correct? Yeah, hopefully it'll be on uh, YouTube next week. We have some, some tangible products coming out. One is the Public Shoreline Access in Maine, a Citizen's Guide to Ocean and Coastal Law, edited by John Duff. We're, this is 10 years old now, we're revising it. And a website produced by Maine C. Grant, Kristen Grant, uh, that has everything you need to know, and perhaps more, about access, legal issues, practical issues, all on our website. We're going to revise that as well. So, on to this evening's speakers. You know, I mentioned John Duff. Uh, John, a partner in this project with us. I should know this by heart, but I don't. I've <laughs> through it several times with John. Uh, John is an associate professor of environmental law and policy at the University of Massachusetts School for the Environment. He received his law degree from Suffolk University in Boston and his master's in law from the University of Washington. Over the last 25 years, he's worked various jobs, including as a newspaper reporter, an attorney in private practice, and general counsel to a nonprofit organization. He has directed marine law research programs at law schools at the University of Mississippi and in Maine, where I met John well over a decade ago. He's been engaged in teaching and research at the University of Massachusetts in Boston since 2004. He is a co-editor of the book International Ocean Law and serves on the editorial board of Ocean Development and International Law. And as I mentioned, John is in the process of updating that real excellent guide, highly accessible, well-written, well-edited guide. Uh, our second uh, lecturer this evening, presenter, is Daniel Wampel. Uh, Dan, can you go ahead and just stand up just so that people see you? That's it. Great, thank you. 
Uh, Dan Wall is a well-known and highly respected attorney and former judge. I graduated from the University of Maine Law School and, well, so I have a master's in law from the University of Virginia. Mr. Wanton began his legal career when he established his own practice in Augusta in 1965. Just 12 years later, in 77, he was tapped to serve as a judge on the Maine Superior Court and on the Maine Supreme Judicial Court in 1981. From 1992 to 2002, Mr. Wanton served as Chief Justice of the Law Court. Mr. Wanton wrote the minority, the dissenting opinion in Dallas, the, the Moody case, as it's come to be known, in 1989, and he also joined the majority in the Eden case, uh, which is the uh, town of Wells uh, Beach, in, in 2000. Mr. Wathen joined the Portland, after he retired from the uh, law court, Mr. Wathen joined the Portland-based law firm of Pierce Atwood, where he spends a substantial amount of his time serving as an arbitrator and a mediator in complex issues and cases around the nation. And you probably saw his name in the paper recently, he takes on tough assignments, I can tell you. He's been serving as a special court master examining issues related to the Riverview Psychiatric Center in Augusta. So the third speaker this evening is Adam Steinman. Adam is an environmental attorney and a scientist. He's got, uh, he's got everything well covered. He earned a law degree and a master's in environmental law from Vermont Law School, clerk for the U.S. Department of Justice's Civil Environmental Law Enforcement Division in Washington, D.C., and an EPA Superfund and Hazardous Waste Enforcement Division in New York City. Following law school, he was associated with law firms in Washington and Portland. Mr. Steinman joined Woodard and Curran, Maine's largest environmental consulting firm, in 1997 and has been a partner since 2001. In addition to this, for the past 10 years, he has served as legal counsel for the main chapter of the Surf Rider Foundation, that's a national organization dedicated to coastal access and protection. Representing Surf Rider in 2011, Mr. Stein argued successfully on the topic of the Public Trust Doctrine and Colonial Ordinance before the Maine Supreme Court in a case that's known as the McGarvey versus Whitridge, which expanded the definition of allowable uses in the, in the intertidal zone. Essentially, you can scuba dive is considered navigation. He'll, uh, Adam will tell you much more about that when he speaks. He has also filed briefs on behalf of Sir Fryer and other high profile cases. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, John Duff. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, and thanks for inviting me here again today. Um, if you've been through any of these sessions previously, I'm always going on and on about my love of always visiting this place, so it will be back here again. Uh, this evening, we are. This is the fourth in our series of discussion on public access issues in the state of Maine. And I think we will have come full circle at the end of this evening. Uh, I think during the first session, I asked folks about what they had heard of fishing, plowing, and navigation. So I'll ask that again. How many of you are familiar with this term, fishing, plowing, and navigation? Right. And you can go around the United States, and few people are familiar uh, with a term that comes from centuries old legal doctrines, and yet in the state of Maine, everyone has it lacent in their minds. Uh, and tonight's discussion will revolve around that term and what it means. It's been around for a while, but its complete meaning uh, is still somewhat unclear, at least to some folks who are advocating a more robust uh, or enlarged um, uh, meaning of what that is. So I, I think it, it's wonderful and crucial that we have with us here this evening uh, a justice who uh, served uh, on the court that heard the Moody Beach case um, and took a part in that opinion and in fact issued a dissent in that opinion uh, that gave hope to people who favored greater or as expanded as possible public access rights to the coast. Uh, and we have that in the person of Chief Justice Waffen. Uh, and also we've got uh, Mr. Simon who has argued many of these cases and I think has, has, has found at least a little bit of ground that has given way uh, to what had been heretofore a very limited interpretation of what fishing and navigation is. So with that, I would like to turn it over to our speakers because they have a wealth of history and understanding and perspectives on these issues. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Chief Justice Walton. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here. I've, I've never been to the reserve before. And I'll come
coming back someday when it's not raining, <laughs> preferably in the summer. Uh, it's really quite beautiful. Uh, you've heard my bio, and for some of you, it will be reassuring to know that my expertise is in mental health and insanity. Uh, that may account for some of my judicial exploitation, but uh, uh, it's not a very good recommendation. I just had a meeting this afternoon involving Riverview, not with the staff at Riverview, which was an exasperating meeting. So, uh, as I told my wife coming down, <clears throat> I'm not in a good frame of mind. But I think I've recovered by now. Well, I want to begin this discussion by telling you that in my 20 years on the Supreme Court, I participated in more than 7,500 opinions, uh, probably like 10,000 opinions. Uh, and I wrote more than 1,000 majority opinions. Uh, I wrote 60 dissents, Bell was one of them, uh, and I wrote 16 separate concurrences. And usually, if somebody asks me about any of those, I have no memory. And if I do, the thing that I'm most likely to remember is which county it came from. I don't know why. I guess it may be my superior court back then. I said, oh yeah, that was a Farmington case. But I don't have a great memory of these cases. My participation in the beach access cases, which went from Bell 1 to Bell 2 to Eaton, spread over 14 years of my 20 years on there, so it really was quite spread out. Uh, but, I do remember the Moody Beach case. Uh, and it's because it is a difficult and important case, but also there's a, probably a more significant reason for it than that. And that is that the, there's a Williams College and Mystic Museum in Connecticut run a program, I think it lasts a semester, uh, for college students. And, and they do a variety of things, but they cap off the program by having a moot court argument conducted by the students on Bell, on the opinion. And for it, I think they're still doing it. Uh, I, did, I did the moot court about six or seven times. So <laughs> since 2002, I've heard re-arguments <laughs> in Bell 2 uh, six or seven times. And moot courts are not the most interesting thing. It's sort of like drinking your own bath water after you've been drilling a couple of times. <laughs> oh, no, not again. But, uh, <laughs> and we were supposed to focus upon, and did focus upon, the performance of the students, not the merits of the case. Uh, and so I rule both ways. I've, I'm not sure which way I usually come out, uh, but I, I certainly, this confirms my belief that this is a case uh, where reasonable minds can differ and do differ, and that it is a difficult case. So anything that I say is provisional. You, there's certainly a good argument to be, to be offered to the opposite side. Uh, I, the other piece of background is that I didn't go back and check the cases, but my predecessors on the court, through an opinion of the justices, which is a strange kind of opinion that we write, and a case or two, they had sort of previewed the public trust doctrine, and some of the justices I think, uh, this is just from memory, I think it was Justice Wernick, actually, had written some of this. And it sort of elevated this discussion about public trust doctrine. Because I remember when we finally got the briefs in uh, Bell 1 and in Bell 2, that I was surprised that there was so little authority about the public trust doctrine. It's, it had been built up a little bit more within the court than actually showed up on the paper when it came here, if you can sort of understand what I'm trying to say. So, rather than taking you through step by step these cases, what I'd like to do uh, is to sort of look at all of these cases 
including the ones that have been decided since I left the court, McGarvey and Elmander, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, and sort of as I read these over, I thought, if I were sitting on a case now, how would I sort of frame my analysis? And I'm sort of a big picture guy. First, I have to see what is it that we're really wrestling with here? What's going on? And then get down to the details. Other people work in the opposite direction. They start with the details and then try to get into the big picture. But that's the way I do it. Uh, and my analysis is this. Barring an overrule of Moody, which I'll talk about whether that's a likelihood or not, uh, there's one thing that is clear, both from all of the cases that went on before, I'm going to call it Moody, it's Bell too. All, everything that went on before Moody and everything that has gone on since, there is one thing that stands out, and that is that the judges on the Supreme Judicial Court are unlikely to apply the fishing, fouling, and navigation formula rigidly. They never have, and I suspect they never will. And so I got thinking, what if, to sort of add a little emphasis to that point, even in Moody Beach case, the majority, which came as about as close as we have ever come to a rigid application of it, went out of their way to explain, uh, they referred to it as uh, a sympathetically generous interpretation. They referred to it as broadly construing and as liberally interpreted. So they, they were, the opinion didn't call for them to sort of draw the line what that meant, because they said recreational, general recreational use, which is what was in the statute, is beyond any of those. But the ordinance does require a sympathetically generous interpretation of what fishing, following, and navigation means. And if you look at the cases that went before that, and I tried to illustrate that in my dissent, they certainly had added a bit to the what you would think of. I'm not sure that they added scuba diving, but they came close in some other respect. So even in that, the court didn't step up and say, that's what it said, fishing, piloting, navigation, that's it. They've never said that. They've added a little bit. So I was thinking of this, why, why are judges sort of uneasy about rigidly applying a formula and sticking to it, or just saying, okay, we've added it quite a bit now, but we're done can't go any further. Uh, and I think there may be two reasons why, whether judges articulate this or not, why you might, if you were in a position of deciding a case, sort of hang back from just rigidly applying it. One is that I think some judges find that they are uneasy about relying on custom as a source of law. And as I said in my dissent, custom is an unwieldy source of law. It's kind of hard to say what is the custom. Uh, and in the law, usually when we're relying on custom, we're relying on something that probably started before the Norman Conquest. I mean, it isn't some recent custom. It is something that is, uh, goes back at least to 12th century England and probably even before that. Uh, and it's often we talk about that this has been the custom from time immemorial. 
We don't know that it's ever been any different under the English common law system. Uh, and that's not what we're dealing with in the case of the uh, colonial bay ordinance. The, so it's a little bit awkward for some of us, and that was sort of what I was trying to convey in my dissent, that we're dealing with a custom, the custom of public right to use the intertidal area, that I guess they used to call it the juice publicum or something like that, which goes back time immemorial. And we're rejecting that custom in favor of a custom which grew out of a 17th century ordinance of a government that is only our ancestor and not directly this, and we're elevating this custom over the other. I'm not suggesting that's wrong, I'm just saying I think people find that to be a little discomforting. That some, some judges like me say we shouldn't be doing this. We should be uh, taking a broader look at it. Uh, and there are, I think, a few judges still on the Supreme Court today who probably feel that same way. Uh, and others don't quite have the same feeling, probably give more credence to stare decisis, property interests, and settled principles, and so on and so forth. So that's one basis for why judges shy away from a rigid application. Secondly, I think that more, perhaps, shy away from the rigid application because by enforcing the, the, the ordinance was created to serve a particular purpose, to advance commercial activity by encouraging the wharfing out at private expense. And it was to do that without interfering with the other commercial activities which were prevalent at the time, fishing, following, and navigation. They don't really even talk about recreational uses at that point. But that's, that was the purpose of the ordinance, was to encourage warping out so that people would engage in commerce. Today, when you apply the ordinance, that purpose no longer exists and hasn't for a long time. Uh, rather, the, the custom that had grown out of that ordinance <coughs> is being used for the purpose of excluding people from the intertidal zone unless they fit within what are, if not outmoded, uh, certainly less important activities than they were at the time of 1600 uh, and there above. So I think that that sort of subconsciously or consciously encourages decision makers to avoid saying just partially, rigidly, uh, fishing, following, navigation is dead. And that's the end of it. Uh, So that's my sort of analysis of why the court continues to be uh, receptive to arguments such as Mr. Simon made, apparently. Uh, question which occurred to me is, will the court overrule Moody? I don't know, they, they, they were three to three. I don't even, I'm not sure who the seventh one is now, but I, I don't know. I suspect not, but it's possible. Uh, will the court continue to chip away? Uh, I think it's highly likely for the reasons that I said. Uh, chip away in the sense that they will <coughs> add to uh, the activities that 
are considered to fall within fishing, following, and navigation, uh, particularly if they have uh, effective arguments made to them along the line. Is this the best way uh, to go about resolving this issue uh, by talking about claims of prescriptive views and by talking about a broad, sympathetically generous interpretation of fishing, following, and navigation? I'm not sure. I, don't, I think the claims of prescriptive views it's unfortunate that that's where we're heading because it will result, it will be very fact dependent as to each beach and you will get a lot of inconsistent results depending upon the quality of the presentation and depending upon the fact finding of the trial judge. Because whether there's a prescriptive use or not is not really a question for the Supreme Court, unless it's, it just isn't any basis for it. Uh, this really turns upon the fact finding of the individual judge. So the road that we're on uh, exposes us to fact finding bakery, vagaries, to expense, to sort of a patchwork possibility, uh, because you can, depending upon the vicissitudes of litigation, you can wind up with a beach here that has one set of uh, uh, public access rights by virtue of prescriptive use, whatever, and then the next beach up, totally different, and so on and so forth. Plus there's a whole lot of expense involved in town. So that's sort of my uh, view. You have to be careful with people who are no longer responsible because you, you know it's the guy who's going to retire is in and he says, I'm leaving tomorrow, but I just want you to know we've been making an awful mistake about something, you know? <laughs> they always have the answer before they the door. <laughs> I'm sort of in that category. <laughs> Thank you very much. specific questions that people may have re regarding uh, the particular speaker. So if folks have a question uh, directly for Chief Justice Waffen, uh, we could field those now. And keep in mind that we will have time after Mr. Steinman uh, speaks uh, to field questions for either of the speakers. Okay. Yes. Hi, um, so to follow your, your path, you most eloquently laid in front of us. Um, do you think that, um, what do you think of the likelihood that, say, the public trust doctrine would be reinterpreted to cover um, tourism or which would mandate more recreational uses of the entire Because the tourism would be the commerce up there. Off the cuff, and you're getting the value of it is exactly what you're paying for. <laughs> <laughs> I, barring an, over, an overruling, which I don't anticipate, I think it's unlikely that you get the general recreation and tourism. I think it's, yeah. Yes? Who do I notify and how do I go about doing so? I post my beach, my private property, no trespass. Now, somebody can say, well, he's never done that. Yeah. Down in the future, I want to know, yes, I have done that. How do I go about doing so? Notifying that you I'd like if, if I, I live in Sauk or Sauk and say to me, well, you never kept people off your beach. Yeah. My response would be for X number of years I've had a very big sign clearly stating private property, no trespassing. Who's going to take my word over who's ever trying to get on my beach unless there's well, some sort of established record? I don't know that there's any registry for registering no trespassing signs, but you could take a picture and every year and uh, and uh, with a calendar or something standing out there. But I mean, it's, 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 it's not that difficult to establish that you have had to sign them. Okay. All right. Okay. Is, there Is there a state statute? Amy, tell them about it. Uh, title 14 MRSA Section 812. <laughs> 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 yeah. Not to get too technical, but... Uh, <laughs> 14 
14 A. A12. The 14 A or 14? 14. MRSA 14 A12. So put that right behind your head, right behind fishing following your navigation. <laughs> your Honor, in your years on the uh, Supreme Court, what's the percentage of uh, motions for reconsideration that have been accepted? Meaning where they've reversed this case or act, did something and did something. Did something other than just denying the motion for reconsideration. Right. I uh, this is this is information that won't do you any good in predicting a particular result. But right. in my years on the court, I only recall twice I believe that we actually changed the result. One we just absolutely changed it totally. We, <coughs> we ruled that way. <laughs> they filed a motion and we said. No, you're right. We were absolutely wrong. I, the, the, the judge who wrote that opinion, he came to me and said, we've got to change this. And I said, Jesus, I hate to do that. He said, what do you think I do? I wrote the opinion. <laughs> so it was pretty rare. We did it. Yeah, yeah anyway. and I'll get back to this gentleman. I wonder, in light of um, the fact that the uses and the deployment ordinance that were allowed in that broad Sympathetically generous. Uh, that at one time, um, driving cattle on the beach was considered a use of not permitted. Yeah. Um, what is your thinking on whether the court will extend under a sympathetically generous interpretation um, the use of walking in the beach? I, I'm, uh, I think that's a possibility. I think sympathetically generous. They, the one thing about Dell or Moody, that sort of, I focused on it in the dissent, but I didn't focus on it the way I should. It seemed to me that the, the landowners that were represented in Moody took the position before the Superior Court that they had no objection to walking on the beach and never would have any objection. I'm not sure that's binding. And it isn't. And I pointed out in my dissent that I'm not sure how long that will last and if I want to rely on that forever. Uh, and it, so it seemed to me that by accepting that, the majority sort of took the guts out of the case because they said, we don't have to think about walking because nobody expects <coughs> walking. And I was saying, yeah, they may object to walking. Yeah. And if they do, I think they're right under your interpretation. You you can't walk. This gentleman back here. Yeah. Oh. Navigation. You keep referring to navigation. Is that strictly by sea? Because uh, I got a little machine that sits on my dash in the car. It says Tom Tom on it. It says to navigate from city to city to city, and I use it quite often. So I would consider navigation walking. I think probably by horse or by wagon. And if you're talking back in the 1700s, uh, King George III told the towns to, to build a road between town to town to take the place of the road on the beach <clears throat> because it was safer now the Indian Wars were over. You've got a great case there. <laughs> if, you, if you've got the money to pursue it, I, <laughs> I've got I'll be around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll <not control. laughs> That's not a disadvantage. No. <laughs> my, my, my reaction to what you said is that, that uh, the court appears to be majoring in budget. Uh, well, I, I think, I mean, the problem with the court is they don't get a chance to select the, the, the questions they'd like to answer. So the one that comes in is, is digging worms a form of fishing? So you say, yeah, okay. And then the next one is, is digging sea manure, which I don't even know what it is, is that a form of fishing? They say, yeah. And then when you come along 100 years later, you're supposed to use those precedents 
and make something reasonable out of them. So yes, the court often is in what you would call fudging. They're drawing very, very narrow lines within specific fact situations. And the point of my discussion was, are they likely to continue drawing lines? My answer is yes. If you want to call that fudging, yes. Yeah. Yeah, the, the comment about walking down the beach is truly becoming the issue du jour now because we've got a sea change in what the folks who own the beach property think is appropriate activity for their neighbors. Right. And so this whole doctrine arose when people were inclined to give permission. And so we've got you know, this presumption of permission. And it's sort of based on this ideal that people, if they knew they weren't going to lose their rights, would be more than happy to let people use their beach. Yeah. When in fact what's happening on the ground is we're having a displacement of local mayors with people who come from communities where they lock the door and lock the gate right. and say, this is my beach and I don't even want to bear witness to your walking. How, how does, how, that's the one thing that it seems to be where it's sort of, that's intention now, and is more likely than not to be where this is headed. How do we resolve those two, the cultural change that is displacing what the law evolved to provide? It seems like there's no easy answer to that. Well, one way of, one way of bringing it to a head and resolving this for the entire state, not just for a beach at a time, would be to go back to the legislature, God forbid, whatever you go, uh, go back to the legislature and have them draft a statute that is somewhat less than general recreational use and specify, uh, and can talk about that maybe, can, and specify what someone thinks the court is likely to uphold. Because I think that I was strengthened in my dissent by the fact that the legislature sort of agreed with my contention. I think it, it isn't binding upon the court because we're dealing with something else. They said it was unconstitutional, but it's persuasive. So if, you, if we could define activities short of, okay, general recreation, you know, let's go out, throw out the picnic basket, a keg of beer, and then lay down in front of your house. Uh, we could throw that out and say, okay, here's some narrow range of activities, nothing narrower than that. That falls within the public rights, the beach, and the court upheld it. That would, that would uh, cut the fog, I and mean, it would do it, you know, one case, one statute. I'm not sure that it's possible, but that would be my suggestion. Okay? I'll be back. Yeah, oh, there's one gentleman. It seems like someone did that with fishing, fouling, and navigation. It seems like someone did that with fishing, fouling, and navigation. In the title of land. But I'm, I'm trying to uh, understand this, this concept of law that was written in the 16th century in England, the 17th century in England, and then common law. Can you give us other examples of where that's come into conflict in this country? I'm not sure what your what the question is. Well, you, you said early on that we had a common law that said English common law that said there's customary usage, and then we get uh, uh, something well, else hundreds of years yeah, later that says the common law in England was that the the intertidal zone stood in the name of the king, but it was subject to the republic rights. It was he couldn't sell it. It was the public had a right to use the intertidal zone for all purposes. A lot of it didn't destroy them. That was the time immemorial. That was probably prior to 1066. Uh, along came the Colonial Bay Ordinance in 1640 or something like that, which for the Colonial Bay, or the Massachusetts Bay, I can find one, Massachusetts Bay, uh, established a different rule for a particular purpose commercial activity. It was an innovative idea. And are there other examples of that unrelated to this particular issue? Just trying to understand where that may have come in conflict before. No, it's unique to it's unique to Massachusetts. The Massachusetts founding fathers thought they knew what they were doing. And they thought this would be great. We'll have wharfing out. Uh, we were all making our living with coastal schooners, I think shortly after that. So it probably made sense that that was the 
essentially your your access to the highway, you know, if you throw like on 95 today. So we won't pay those, we won't do that at public expense. We will do it at private expense by encouraging people to wharf out. And if, if you didn't change the law, you couldn't wharf out because I have a right to walk through the gotcha. Thank you. Sir. That's, does that make that clear? Yeah. Uh, I've done a lot of reset on wells and in the 1640s, all the land in Wells was first granted by the agents of the king, and it was granted to the natural seawall, to the seawall. Mm -hmm. And then we didn't become part of Massachusetts until, I think, 1653, and about all of this land along the edge of the coast had been granted by that time, and then the towns collect men were granted. Right. And, and there's over 60 deeds that go in the town of Wells to the natural seawall, which also includes down right to a comfort, the end of comfort. And I haven't followed up the coast, I just looked at Wells. And that's using it like the King's Highway, like the road, they were using it for road like you talked about. Then they turn around and Massachusetts voted that you could have it to the Puritans, that you could have it to the low water mark. Well, also I have I never went and looked it up, but I understand in the archives of Massachusetts it says that they'll accept all deeds as when we became part of Massachusetts. Right, went back and forth a few times, they said it was as agreed on. So I think it should be, it should be, it should, it should go right back to the court again. They should look at that the original deeds and, see, and the part that you play. And it, with that, I think it's a whole new game. It, and if it is, if it went to the natural seawall, they shouldn't be having ownership of it. We always knew as a kid, I knew I could get down there. I didn't know why. But I knew I could get down there. And, and, uh, all of a sudden, it, them rights have been taken away from us, and they shouldn't have been. And, and I understand, but I think a lot of court rulings come out probably the wrong way. <laughs> this, in my mind, this was one of them. Well, hey, the saying is on the Supreme Court that we're not last because we're right, we're right because we're last. <laughs> Do you want to continue or do you want to <laughs> as Jeff for you? You'll get another whack at me after you've heard it. And Adam may straighten it out. So. <laughs> Basically what you said with the Crown having ownership of the as custom. I mean, as a strict matter, the, the ordinance in, of the Massachusetts Bay Colony is no more binding of law in the state of Maine than Quincy's zoning ordinance is today. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense that that becomes a law. It was accepted because it became accepted in Massachusetts as on the basis of custom. This is the way people have always done it. And then when we separated from Mother Massachusetts, we finally, we finally said, enough of that, we're on our own, but we're going to accept that as being part of the common law of Massachusetts, and therefore it's part of the common law of Maine. So that's what I say. Judges, some judges have trouble with that concept. Uh, and at least it's shaky enough so that if, even if you say, well, I accept the concept, that's already been decided, forget it. it. It still leaves you a little bit uncertain about how rigidly you should apply this fishing power and navigation. Okay. Thanks.
in general, it's never good to follow the chief. <laughs> Tonight is my video. So, this has been a, a very significant um, issue for me for a number of reasons. Uh, I'm an avid surfer. Um, and representing surf writers in the thing about 2003 and from 2003 to 2000, actually 2002, 2002 to 2011, we were waiting for a case to really argue it because it had been my feeling for a couple of decades that Chief Justice Watkins got it right and the rest of the, 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 the Florida judge um, majority had it wrong and eventually we were going to get a court that was going to be sympathetic to it. Um, I left private practice in uh, 97 and having quite a lot of environmental cases, mostly in federal court. Um, in 2011, I found myself before the main Supreme Court arguing um, for an issue I felt strongly about. Uh, and it was pretty fun to have the first question come from the bench in my first oral argument before the main law court be from Justice Alexander, who looked at me very gravely boy said, So, Mr. Stein, you really surf the tubes up in Eastport, Maine, on Great Pond? And um, from that point forward, I thought, oh, this is going to really be fun. <laughs> and, uh, I assured Justice Alexander I did not surf tubes in Eastport, but in foreign language surfers are pretty resilient. <coughs> Um, group that had to be, had, under the right conditions, we certainly could get a circle related. And if any of us were there, we would. Um, it's exciting for me to be here because once every 10 years I had an event to wear this tie. And I really can find a good time to wear it other than when I'm talking about these issues. Um, so I'm happy to be here for that reason. The um, in listening to, to Justice Lockton and having really researched this for three different main law court briefs, um, every time I read this series of cases in recent history, I'm left scratching my head. It seems like before Bell One, customary uses, colonial ordinance, pretty <coughs> consistently the courts, both in Massachusetts, as well in May, as Maine, had always seen the colonial ordinance and fishing, fouling, and navigation to supplement what uses has customarily been enjoyed by the public, and that's the public trust. So people had always walked up and down the beaches. People had been using the beaches to swim um, since time immemorial. People, it was not until the colonial ordinance where we had to encourage private owners to spend their own money to work out that we had the colonial ordinance, and it's for that specific purpose. We recognize, okay, if we do that, that could inhibit the public's rights, and the public clearly has these three rights, as well as the customary rights that they have enjoyed. We get the one, and we're told no. In fact, those are the three rights, and those are the only three rights. However, we're going to lessen the blow and make sure we take a generously sympathetic view of what falls under those rights. And we will construe things broadly. And, any, and all of the language that you possibly say, to basically say, we're taking away rights here, but don't worry, there's a lot of stuff that can still be done um, under fishing, fountain, and navigation. And really, a lot, basically the fishing rights and how far they had been expanded had been litigated for hundreds of years earlier and that's where we get the sea manure and that's where we get the digging for worms. Pretty much now fishing is fishing and um, climbing is climbing and we got that. Navigation had, had evolved over time where we went from rowboats to powerboats to sailboats to, to, go, to having sleds go over um, frozen water over the intertidal zone and we, made, we had expanded those rights pretty much to the extent we're going to expand it. And anything that's boat related, I think we're all going to pretty much agree, OK, that's you know, that's a uh, fouling sound. Navigation is going to be the key. That's really the last place where we can have some significant expansion. So we have L1. We have, you have a 4-3 majority say those are the only three rights. You have L2, 
affirm that those are the only rights and tell the main legislature the passage of the act is unconstitutional, it's a take it's a judicial taking, we can't have that. That's what you got. Eaton, we're told, when you have a town that can show the five elements of prescriptive easement, prescriptive use, you're going to be able to keep public um, speeches public so long as you're able to essentially identify the owners, show the owners were on notice, show that the people were using um, the beach in a way that was adverse to their ownership rights or at least those restrictive for ownership rights. And we really cannot have a court case that really looked at scope of navigation for quite some time. We get this little case um, up in Eastport, and on the same day that, they, that the law court heard that case, they also heard a similar case that, that is in Cape Elizabeth. The Cape Elizabeth case was over Secrets Beach, tiny little beach, nasty, nasty um, fight between neighbors, people gaining access, people with needed rights to the beach, very messy case. Um, court decides we're not going to touch these messy issues in a messy case. So they take this little case in Eastport, you got one neighbor versus another neighbor. Basically, they both own, they both sit on the beach, but one neighbor owns the, 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 the all of the beachfront. The, the subservient owner has a scuba diving company, walks over the beach, takes people from Boston scuba diving. After the first dive, they sit on the beach, they have lunch, they have a beer, they go back, have another scuba dive, come back, have another beer, have some more food to go home. And they fight it, and the woman who owns property says, I don't want to school that anymore. So that's where we get McGarvey. In McGarvey, and again, it's the first time this, uh, this Supreme Court of Maine is hearing these issues for a long, long time. In a fairly surprising case to me, in that you have a six on majority, you have all you have the six justices who are sitting there basically say, generously sympathetic, broadly construed. Scuba diving is a form of navigation. You get from point A to point B. You need some sort of um, additional device other than your own body to get there. We can see this as navigation. Um, and in the 6 0 decision, they all agree navigation, scuba diving, scuba diving, clearly navigation. Um, and, and it's clearly navigation. You can have your tom tom may not work underwater, but uh, if you did, I'm going to show you go from the point A to the point B. Half the court says, yeah, it is navigation, and we should expand it. But the truth is, Chief Justice Walker had it right back in Bell. Public trust doctrine should tell us we have all sorts of, of, of rights there. We should have the right to swim. We should have the right to walk. We should have the right to Sunday. This is the gateway to what is clearly a public resource, the water. Um, and if you can't get to the water, how public is that resource? So three justices say we would flip bell. We would overturn it. So it says it's not, uh, not withstanding. Um, we think that the, the law was wrong. Uh, we think that the decision in, in bell was one and two were wrong, and we would flip it. Three agree, three don't, you don't have a majority, Bell stays good law. All six say, yeah, it's time to expand navigation. And Mr. Simon, while you've argued about surfing and you've argued about paddleboarding and boogie boarding and floating with, with plastic wings, those issues are not before us today. When they are before us in a footnote, they say, we'll kind of take a pretty generously <laughs> sympathetic view of what navigation is, and you can bring up all of these other activities. That was essentially the state of the law, November 2011. And for those advocates who are on this side of the fence, which includes the state of Maine, because the state of Maine recognizes for multiple policy reasons the intertidal zones and the beaches should be open to the public and the people of Maine. Economically, it's a huge attraction uh, to tourism, and when we have you know all of the negative business things that are going on at state. Here's actually something that does bring people to state and does have people spend money. Um, so we're going to wait for that next case. We have the Chief Justice Software, who has been public uh, pro-access, was on the, the pro-access side. 
Um, in the Eaton case, although there she came out and said, hey, I would overturn Welsh. She wrote the majority opinion in the party that said, I would, I would overturn um, Bell 1 and 2. So we're waiting. Um, private property rights owners are saying, okay, we still have our majority, but it's thin. It's a 3 3 tie, and who knows where the second justice will be. So along comes Kenny Gunport. Um, and because of the state of the law, we're, we're really forced to litigate these cases beach by beach, activity by activity. Very expensive, very inefficient, waste of judicial resources, waste of a lot of people in this room's money and time and effort, and they tend to get really, really contentious at times, pitting neighbor against neighbor, um, back by owners against front by owners, outside tourism to people from away against people from here. Um, in general, there's a lot of conflict involved in this, in, in addition to a lot of money. From, from where I sit, Almeida, the town of Kennebunk Court, is teed up perfectly. At trial, first of all, you have over 60 people get deposed and testify to all the different uses they've done. Um, uh, they've done on these rock feet, from playing softball, to playing soccer, from prisons, to Sunday, from walking, to surfing, to paddleboarding. Um, basically, a plethora of different uses. You have a three-week trial. They've discussed all of those issues. You have Beachfront owners saying, yeah, we, we don't want to see these surfaces out there. We kind of like it. We participated in the, in the softball games. Law court sits and hears an opinion. Basically, there are a few different theories of law. One is the town, because of 100 years of undisputed uses of all sorts of types and um, <coughs> ongoing beach maintenance and lifeguards and having spent money and then promoting tourism, we have acquired general rights of recreation from the low water mark actually up to the, to the dry sand because that's what's happened for 100 years. And when we look at the legal reasoning in Eaton, where, they, where the kind of wells acquired prescriptive easement, it looks a lot like Goose Rock's speech. On the public trust doctrine, you have a chief justice who is not only um, generously sympathetic to the concept of expanding navigation, but is also very much in favor of flipping Bell 1 and Bell 2 and, and finding those general recreation rights. Um, so what happened? Well, the truth is I don't know what happened. <laughs> um, I'm a betting man in general, and if someone would have asked me uh, what am I betting on before that decision came out, I would have said I'm betting on, at a minimum, a fairly aggressive expansion of return navigation to include what the trial court found, which was essentially all water-based activities but for swimming and walking. Um, and if we get lucky, this will be the case that overturns Bell. That didn't happen. We get a decision that basically says, we're not going to decide public trust. We're not going to decide whether the colonial ordinance is um, navigation terms should be expanded to include things other than scuba diving and boating. Um, and frankly, on a prescriptive easement, because we can't show any individual property owner, I mean, this is me paraphrasing it quite a bit, I think, but because we can't show any single property owner or specific property owners necessarily gave permission or, or, the, or showed it, or we could show adversity to them, we really think that the town has not proved its um, claim to acquire Blue Rock Speech for public recreation property based on um, prescriptive use, use um, based on prescriptive use and purposes. A lot of us in this room are on this side of the day. Oh crap, what happened? We went from towns can acquire beaches and navigation's gonna be expanded, and chief who I think is ready to put down to, you got nothing. Until Three weeks later, they say, you know what? We're going to hear pretty hear. That's now six months ago, I think. Six months and two weeks. But who's counting? Um, what's that? April 19th. April 19th. April 19th. April 19th. So, so I think six months, two weeks is about right. Um, every week. So, where do we go from here? Um, I am still a veteran. Um, I think the chief is absolutely right 
if the court does not take this opportunity, at least at this phase, to expand navigation, at a minimum, we're going to see a number of new uses um, be approved as constituting navigation. I think with a little luck, because remember, all of these decisions, well, not all of these, Bell, Bell's one and two were four to three in favor of private property owners. Um, the McGarvey case was three to three. We have a new justice um, who will decide public trust at some point, whether it, it probably won't be this case. But, um, so I do think at a minimum, the chief's like, we're going to get use by use activity, activity, beach by beach, expansion of um, what constitutes navigation, hopefully to the point where it follows up the rule and we don't have to, we don't have to argue about this anymore. I'm not sure we're going to get walking, and, you know, I, not because we shouldn't and not because it's not a form of navigation. I know when I have my time, time, if I put on the walk mode, it tells me I'm navigating and I'm getting point A to point B. Um, but it seems like walking and swimming have, have become hot spots for the court. Um, do we flip Bell? Peace. I hope so. Um, and I think there are very, very big, bad, scary implications for the state of Maine if we don't eventually flip Bell. Because um, Justice Walker's right. Uh, and he said it very succinctly in, his, in the conclusion of his dissent. He said, yeah, OK, well, it's great that on Moody Beach the current property owners are saying they're giving permission. But will they? When I, well, when I look at Moody Beach now, it doesn't look like a very hospitable place for people um, who are not property owners. I mean, the signs are pretty scary. The signs are pretty nasty. I know even when I go kayaking up and down the coast, basically, if I land on any beach, I have an owner of the property on me very, very quickly whenever I get to a private beach. At that point, I start stealing Navigation, fishing, here's my rod, here's my boat. <laughs> then they go back to their they go back to their house. But the only reason they're going back to the house is because I have to know the law. So one, we need to inform the populace. Um, and two, hopefully we get a change. Um, I guess lastly I just have to say that Maine is in a very, very small minority of states when it comes to granting private ownership, even restricted private ownership, to the low water mark. The vast majority of states only give it to the high water mark or to the top of the dry sand. So does that make sense in a state where we have over 3,500 miles of coastline? I think not. Um, and when you look at the legislation that's coming out of Hawaii, Texas, Oregon, California, and I realize they're all over there or down there, um, the legislation is consistently pro-public access, put the private owners through the hoops that we have to go through now um, as young public. And, and it's not only the legislation, the cases that are being decided, particularly in those states, um, are going to public access as <coughs> well. from 
the ocean, but you may not uh, sit there and, and, and picnic. That's a trespass, and you owe her one dollar. So that was the decision we got. Would it clarify things if everyone was given a water pistol to shoot seagulls? <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a pretty famous quote. You can walk down the beach in Maine with a, a gun or a rod, but you can't walk down the beach with a surfboard or nothing at all. So, I mean, I, I will say, when I go, if, if I don't have, and, and I, am, I have considered the quote to have given me surfing, uh, even though they had it, so I walked down both beaches with a surfboard, but if I'm just going to the beach, I, I, and I'm not sure, but I usually bring a kayak and or a fishing rod, so I think a water pistol might work. I'm not sure how effective it would be. <laughs> so where does the 200 mile limit begin? High water or low water? Federal government owns up to 200 miles of inner city national waters. Well, yeah, you have a few different. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. You have a couple of different laws that regulate three miles, six miles, twelve miles, and out to 200 miles. It used to be 12 um, miles, and now it's 200. But where does it begin? High water or low water? I think it begins depending on where the tide is. I mean, if it's high tide, it, it certainly no, goes no, no. Where does it begin? High water or low water? That's your two limits. High water. I believe the federal is, is to the low water. I think so. Then you can't navigate between low. Oh, of course you can. What happens when the tie tie? The tie tie, and I'm in the boat, and I go to the beach, and I'm like, I know the answer. Okay, go. <laughs> You're referring to what is known as the baseline, uh, and that is the, the point from which we measure state and federal waters for both domestic and international purposes. Landward of the baseline, which is the intertidal zone, would be referred to as internal waters. So you still get to do it. At the uh, argument for reconsideration, uh, it, there seemed to be a fair amount of confusion on the court. Uh, a number of the justices on uh, the question of the Indian title zone you know, suggested that the opinion that they had written in Alameda uh, anticipated that that uh, issue would be remanded to the trial judge to try. And Pete Baxter and Amy immediately jumped up and said, we already tried that. You had an explanation on that. That they pretty basic. Here are seven justices who voted in, in lockstep uh, some of them voting against the opinions that they had written previously, like the Chief Justice, uh, and showing a great amount of confusion. And within the opinion that they wrote, there were factual mistakes, such as uh, Judge Brent, Justice Brennan had granted a motion for intervention to the back level. In fact, he denied it. I have an opinion, but I, we also have Amy and Jen both in the audience. Um, uh, so I'm going to defer to my colleagues uh, <laughs> sitting one right three rows behind you. I'll pass to them. <laughs> I would just say I think that's why the court's taking so long on reconsideration is because um, there was there was a little bit of confusion as to whether the uh, public trust issue should be addressed now or should be remanded back to the lower court. And uh, even at, in a rare moment of uh, unanimity, both the, the plaintiffs, the beachfront owners in the case, and you know, the state and the town all said, no court, you should decide this now. And so I think now they're forced into a, into a position where they're figuring out how to decide that question. And, and it's a very difficult question, and as Justice Walton said, um, intelligent people can differ on that issue, and I think they're struggling with it. I have a question, perhaps for both of you, both you and Chief Justice. Um, in reading uh, Justice Lewis' opinion, 
and quoting uh, the phrase uh, that Mr. Austin just mentioned, the sympathetically generous interpretation of fishing following and navigation. Uh, it goes on to state not only the sympathetically generous interpretation of fishing following and navigation, he also states or reasonably incidental or related thereto. It seems very open and very broad. So I just find it curious. We have Marlon's book edits here. We have a Justice uh, who wrote the dissent in Moody. Uh, and then we have you who argued successfully in the garden. So 21 years later, this issue of uh, sympathetically generous and incidental to was ruled. So it seems like it's, it's open for compromise. It's open for more opinions. And we had to wait 21 years to get to that. And I just was curious of, uh, well, why did it take so long? And uh, why weren't there some compromise here? Let's, let's define this in a reasonable, compromising way. If you have a Chief Justice who states that uh, sympathetic and generous, and then incidental to, uh, it sounds as if he's welcoming something other than that strict interpretation of the issue problem in that case. We have to wait for you to argue the case for the pursuit of the, uh, that's a disadvantage of the litigation system, is that courts act only on cases. We don't sit down and write a treatise on what we think public access should be. We have to wait for the next case. And we don't choose the cases. If we did, they would be different than the ones that we actually get. Uh, and so the law to the courts is dependent upon the cases that come to trial. And if they never come to trial, the court will never act upon them. But couldn't that have been also an invitation to the legislature to, re to revisit the land tax? In other words, don't make it so wrong, make it so that it can fit into this, uh, this incidental too, that such as scuba diving or birding, for example, which are part of it. It, it could have been. And that, that was sort of my suggestion that one possible way of doing it would be to legislatively define things short of general recreation that might pass muster and see if it, somebody takes it up. Yeah. And then people 30 and 40 years from now when they have totally different uses can stand upon those. Um, I, I think I don't often disagree with my old boss. Uh, Justice Nikusik, um, but we have on this one. Um, and I always also took the incidental there too to be activities incidental to fishing, fowling, and navigating. So we talked, it, which is why I said I think McGuffey got it wrong when they said you couldn't have the picnic after the scuba diving, because you were allowed to have the picnic after boating, because that was deemed to be an activity incidental there too. Uh, yeah, what was the Intertidal Land Act? It was passed in the state of Maine that was later declared by the Constitution. What was that? The what? The Intertidal Land oh, Act. It was a it was a, a statute that said Amy and the other ones. It was a statute that said uh, that the public had the right to use the intertidal zone for recreational purposes. Yeah, they were trying to clarify. And that was what the that was what Moody Beach case said is unconstitutional. Why? Why is it unconstitutional? Because it exceeds fishing, fouling, and navigation ah. as sympathetically interpreted. Because general recreation is yeah, swimming, laying on the beach, as the trial judge said, slathering your body with oil. <laughs> I never knew what slathering was. <laughs> I guess that's what you folks down here in York County <laughs> Something like what I was suggesting, only the court said it went too far. So it didn't say you couldn't do, but add something, but it said this goes too far. I'm puzzled by the birth of proof seeming to rest with the town of Kitty Monk and work in us residents. When I haven't seen any evidence that the beach front owners own the dry sand or the Intervalley. And the research on uh, 120 or so properties 
chose a great variation of references to the outer edge of their product, property. How can we have such a strong uh, prejudice for private ownership and against public use? Uh, and why within the court system is the burden so out of balance? And I'm heated on this one because it is distributed by the press. I'm a person who bought a goose rock because I'm an old polio kid who can't walk very well. That's the best walking I have on God's earth. It's flat, it goes way out, and uh, it does, I won't go to confine myself to seven or ten lots between in that one area owned by the Conservation Trust in, in that limited area. I'd love to at least walk to that point out to Denver Point. And I talked to Bob on leader just last week at the supermarket, and he said, I'm not going to take away your right, Peter. And I said, I'm not guaranteed that right. And I don't know who buys your property next to the property next door to keep me from walking there. What? Well, I have some rights. Yeah, it seems like I've been told no, and in fact, consulted by the last uh, Supreme Court. Yeah. The implication of the, the law at this point is, no, you don't have the right to walk on the intertidal land unless you have fishing, following, and navigation. And things that are incidental to it. But that's the point. That's the point. Because hidden within your question is, isn't it possible that some people's land is described by meets and bounds as ending at the dry sand? Yeah. And if it is, that's what they own. They don't own it. Somebody else may own it. In the case that he was talking about, the worst possible situation in Washington County is he owns down to the dry sand. I own, I'm next to it, and I own all of mine up front and his, too. So when I say, stay off my intertidal zone, and that was the... Yeah, that, that, that's McGarvey. Yeah, that's McGarvey. Um, I do, I, I will sort of just pump it again back to Amy and, and, uh, and Ben a little bit. It's my understanding that some of those issues have not yet been litigated. The, the parcel? What is that? Is that the issues of title and who owns uh, the nature of the, the uh, in between low water mark and, and, uh, and high dry sand have not been litigated. The other thing is just reading it. And not knowing anything about the record. The other thing that sort of confuses that Blue's Rocks case to me is that the town itself owns several lots along. And I don't know that it makes any difference legally, but uh, it gives you access points to the beach. Uh, I, it, I looked at it and said, thank God I'm not an employee. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I might change my mind. <laughs> so actually, actually, let me tell you this, that it would be a serious question whether consistent with the doctrine of stare decisis, I could flip it. It really would be. Because, I mean, the theory of our case is that unless you can demonstrate that it was absolutely wrong, I have done it a couple of times. I've gone back and flipped cases that I didn't prevail on the dissent. Uh, but it would be a tough call, really, as to whether you should do it. Because I shouldn't, I shouldn't take advantage of a change in the personnel of the court. The court was the court. They decided by majority vote. That's supposed to stand. So it would be tough, but I'm still happy that I'm not there. <laughs> We've got a couple of minutes left for, for our defined time period laws. I know that Adam indicated he is going to stay for a few minutes after that, so that people want to kind of hang back and ask questions. Um, I know a number of people have had an opportunity for back and forth. Is there anyone who has not answered that question? All right. Yes, ma'am. Um, it's my understanding, at least this is a question for Amy, um, that people at Loose Rocks do not pay taxes on the square footage of sand that they own, that they claim that they own? So then how do they own it? Well, they're presumed to own it by, by the Maloney Ordinance. That, but that, that, that word presumption is important because there, there hasn't been proof in this case that they, that they do own it. It's a presumption that's capable of being 
has been deficient. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. And, and frankly, to me, that was one of the troubling aspects of the Bell II case, because one of the rationales was saying the, uh, the, legislative, the, the legislative act was unconstitutional was because they were taking property without just compensation. Um, and I think, well, and that was the judicial taking. I had to think the people who came were the recipient of a reverse judicial taking with Bell, Bell 1 and 2, where they took what had been a very public piece of land, said you don't have these rights anymore, and the people are not taxed on that extra square footage. Um, so, personal bias. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious, um, Chief Justice, well, you were on the Bell case and also on the Eaton case. Why didn't the court uh, take Chief Justice Softley's uh, suggestion to revisit the Bell case at that point in time? You had two uh, almost adjoining beaches with very similar arguments. Um, it seems to me that it would have been a perfect opportunity for the court to have said, well, you know, maybe, maybe we should revisit that, and yet, the, the, the court decided against uh, Chief Justice Softley's suggestion. I'm curious if why well, I can't remember the exact facts of it, but my impression now of what I must have been thinking at the time was that there was no occasion to consider that argument. The prevailing party had gained what all they could gain by virtue of prescriptive easement, their prescriptive use that they were entitled to. So we affirmed that. There's really no occasion to go back and say, oh, you may have the same rights by virtue of us overruling Bell II. And I, because that would trigger all of the stare decisis sort of considerations. And it was unnecessary. It wouldn't add a thing to what they prevailed. Yeah. yeah. So were there any questions between Amy and Ben? I wondered a um, question for both of you. Um, the court seemed, in its opinion, to um, be eager to sort of place um, public access in the hands of this landowner permission and presumption of permission. And, um, and in the prescriptive easement aspect of the case, you know, the presumption of permission is really difficult to overcome. But I wonder, in the public trust doctrine section of the decision, the very last sentence of the opinion, I wonder if I can get your interpretation of this, because there's a paragraph on the public trust doctrine where the court essentially says, we don't, we're not reaching this on the merits, it's not right yet. And then the very last sentence says, we note also that the presumption of permission applies to the intertribal zone as well as to the dry sand for all general recreational activities, and then in a footnote, it includes all these activities, which include a lot of things that, as Adam has said, would be a sympathetically generous um, form of navigation. And so is it, is it possible that the court could be saying, as long as the beachfront owner um, is silent and is presumed to get permission in the intertalism for all of these general recreational activities, which include navigation, we're fine, but all the landowner need to is object, and then what? What? What do we make of uh, the public trust doctrine at that possibility? Does that make sense? Uh, between Adam and I, we know everything. He knows that. Okay. I'm not just saying he's smarter than me, anyway. So, uh, <laughs> Why did you put the presumption of permission anywhere in a section dealing with the public trust doctrine? Is it so that that can overcome this? This the law that. that public has these rights, inalterable rights, regardless of who objects or not. I, you want to, I got an answer, but I'm not sure. I, I, I defer to my, my answer is that I don't understand the opinion. I mean, that's, that's the troublesome part to me. Uh, I, I participated in cases I dimly recall, the Augusta Country Club case is the predecessor to that. Um, and I, I joined in that. We talked about the presumption of permission and if you don't gain anything in the public and that sort of thing. And so I participated. The application of it that they were making in there, I don't, I don't really understand. I 
spend a lot of time on it, but I don't understand it. And the other thing I don't understand, it just sort of strikes me at all, <coughs> is that when they get around to the talking about an easement by custom or whatever it is at the end, they say, this has no application because that, that applies only to customs that are from existed from time immemorial. And it's generally conceded the United States hasn't been around long enough to have any customs that are <laughs> I thought, what the hell are you talking about? The Matthews and Bay Ordinance, you know? <laughs> the custom. I mean, isn't that a little bit inconsistent? But I, that's my own little pet Steve coming up here. But I, I don't understand it. Man. You I, uh, in absolute agreement, I do not understand that decision. That may be part of the reason why they reconsidered it. Opinions often take on a life of their own, and unless you go back, uh, you know, you start negotiating back and forth with your clients over the word that you know with your client. I've, I've shifted into a different world. <laughs> your colleagues. And and finally, you know, you put the opinion all together, you think, wow, that's perfect. And then you go back and you look at the deeds, and that's the key thing. You have to go back and look at the deeds. You think, I've taken this right out of them the fog. I'm not even talking about what the parties were talking about. <laughs> so it's very easy for an opinion to take on a life of its own and to deviate from the issue that the party is actually presented. So I don't know that that happened, but it has happened to me that I wound up with a wonderful opinion that had very little to do with what the party did. <laughs> <laughs> and so I would go back and attempt to address it. Yeah. So Ben, do you want to finish up and then, and then we'll break and whoever wants to, to, to come forward may do so. Um, just with that footnote, um, and, and you just mentioned opinion, so this is, this is just mine, that the footnote about within the part portion of the decision discussing the public trust doctrine, why they brought up the presumption of permission. Uh, my guess is simply that, look, um, we're going to, whether, whether we decide these are going to be uh, activities that are allowed under the public trust, trust doctrine or not, up until the time that we decide those things, Main law presumes that you have the permission of the owner to engage in recreational activities in the intertidal zone and in the high dry sand. It doesn't matter. Main law presumes that. And so I think well, the only thing that footnote is meant to, to say is just to pinpoint that issue and, and make sure that people don't lose sight of the fact that the court isn't saying you can't recreate in the intertidal zone. What they're saying is we may not reach that issue right, right now and today, but but the law presumes that you have the permission of the landowner to recreate in the intertidal zone. It's a, it's a very complicated case. And the whole issue is very complicated. And you and Amy and Adam know more about it probably than anyone needs to know. But it is a tough, it is a tough case. That's probably a good explanation. Footnotes and uh, opinions should be avoided whenever possible. Uh, I, this is a little bit, this isn't off color, but it's, I always thought it was fun. I think it was Noel Coward that said that encountering a footnote is like going downstairs to answer the doorbell while you're making love on the second floor. <laughs> <laughs> it sort of brings me. <laughs>